Would you please be seated? Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different in place of the sermon. Um, It's actually, we'll be having a three-part talk. Um, I've uh, had the privilege of speaking with um, Mr. James Lake this past week, who is our organ builder, who is currently doing the refurbishment on um, this side of the organ. Believe it or not, it's half gone. So if it seemed a little, if it seemed a little less loud today, that's what's going on. Half the organ is gone. We're only using the swell, right? Yes, on this side. And um, so there's a, a three-part talk that I'd like to give. I'd like to start off by speaking about worship, and then I'm going to have Leah come up and give us a bit of theological rationale for why we worship the way we worship, particularly with the organ today. And um, then um, James will come up and give us some theological reflections as well as just some practicalities on how an organ enhances worship, how it leads us in song. So, it's not coincidence, I think, that As we're speaking about worship today, it's the festival of Michael and all angels. I think the Lord has a sense of humor often when I choose texts and often when things happen to be scheduled. And so here we see the readings talking about none other but worship. But of course, it's not our worship that's being talked about. And I think that the Lord in his providence has set it up this way, maybe to humble us. Because worship isn't all about us, first and foremost. First and foremost, it's about God. The Presbyterian, our Presbyterian friends um, who wrote the Westminster Catechism said that it's the end of God to worship him and enjoy him forever. To worship him and enjoy him forever. That's the end of the the goal of all humanity. And yet, as humanity, that goal is not something that just we as human beings participate in. You might recall a couple weeks back, we were singing as the song of praise, all things bright and beautiful. Right? Do you remember that? The idea is that all of creation actually worships God. Even in our fallen state, all of creation cannot help but to worship God. And in fact, as far as we look at creation, we think of animals and even inanimate objects. But creation, creatures, is literally everything created by God. So everything from the lowest form of life through us, where we're kind of floating in the middle, attached physically to our bodies and created to be both body and spirit, up through the angelic ranks, the nine choirs of angels, which I could go on at length, but I won't, all the way up to God himself, the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, who is not created but being worshipped by that whole caste, that whole hierarchy of creatures. It's a humbling thing to know that right now, angels are worshipping God. Right now, there are angels and elders sitting in the throne room, bowing down before God and saying, as Revelation chapter 4 and Daniel tells us, holy, holy, Holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Why do we say that every Sunday during the Eucharist? Because worship's not about us. Worship is not our creation. Worship is something we're invited to participate in because it's continually going on. And so we're invited to come in and say, along with the angels and archangels, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord our God. 
Now, I was at the uh, Great Lakes Anglican Diocese of the Great Lakes Mission, or Mission, what is that? Uh, Anglican Diocese of the Great Lakes Clergy Retreat this week with my wife Leah, and we had the privilege of hearing from a bishop um, by the name of, um, oh, why can't I think of his name? He's from the Diocese of the Mid-Atlantic. It'll come to me. And Bishop Guernsey was saying that notice, in worship, it's not love, love, love is the Lord God Almighty. It's not Almighty, Almighty, Almighty is the God, Lord God Almighty. But it's holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Meaning that God is holy. He's set apart. He's unlike anything else. And therefore our worship of him is also set apart, unlike anything else, or should be. Now, it's true that our worship comes from us as bodies and souls, as physical and spiritual creatures united. And therefore, in some ways, it's different from the angels. And yet, it's the same idea. The Hebrew word for worship is shaha, meaning to fall down before God with one's whole self, body, mind, and spirit. It doesn't mean to feel close to God. It doesn't mean to experience God, although often worship is those things. But it's to fall down prostrate, face to the ground before a holy God. And if angels do that, how much more must we? In the Greek, Jesus, speaking about worship, uses a similar word called proskino, meaning literally to bend the knee, to genuflect, to bow before God. Many of us do that as we come into church. Many of us do that as we pass the altar. But that's a physical, an intentionally physical manifestation of what we're supposed to be doing with our hearts. Recall that great psalm, Psalm 90, the Venite. O come, let us sing before the Lord. Let us shout for joy to the rock of our salvation. Let us bow down and worship him. Right? Let us bow down and worship him, for he is our creator. So worship is something we do with our whole selves. And corporate worship, when we come together here, is something that we do ritually with actions and words and songs, but always very intentionally because it's something that we're not doing half-heartedly or lightly, but something we're giving God that's of worth. Do you know that the English word worship actually comes from two old English words, worth and ship? Worth and ship. Put those together, well, what is God worth? Everything, all things. So it's an act of gratitude, an act of thankfulness, our response to God. And ship, of course, is just a state of being, right? To have good statesmanship is to have a good, a good being of being a statesman for the country, right? So worship is literally giving God worthy praise and bowing down before him out of thankfulness and gratitude in awe and grandeur. Who worships? Well, we all worship. And as we're following our points here, that ought to be our worship as we come together corporately. Corporate worship is something that is the culmination of what we're doing throughout the week, as Jesus tells us in the Beatitudes today. Our worship is our acts of service. Our corporate worship is the act of the liturgy. I'd like to invite Leah to come forward now and follow up and talk about how our holy worship transcends everyday life into the presence of God.
Um, this morning, while I was preparing for this, um, I reread Revelations 4, um, which describes our worship in heaven. Um, and it talks about the living creatures and the 24 elders and all of creation singing together. Um, and I think that's a really significant thing, that the most important thing about our um, music is our own voices. It's not an instrument, it's not individuals, but it's all of us together corporately worshiping um, in music. And um, that's not the most important part of worship, of course, which would be the scriptures and the teaching of it. Um, but the Lord gave us music um, very purposefully. Um, in the Psalms, we have an entire book of, of music, right? We don't know what it would have sounded like, but we know what was in the songs themselves. Um, and I, I once heard this um, pastor talk about how the music is, in some ways, more important, the content of it, than the rest of the service, because when um, we leave worship services, usually we're not really stuck on anything that a priest says, but more often than not, what we've been singing actually is going through our minds. Um, I actually, many of you know my own background, that I, I grew up in a church that actually didn't, for the most part, um, preach the word of God. And much of the theology that I learned as a child, yes, it came from my own family who were faithful Christians, but a lot of it came from the music we were singing. Um, and that is how I um, actually learned a lot of um, good theological, orthodox um, Christianity. Um, so I'm, I'm very grateful for the hymnody that um, the church sang, because even if they weren't faithful in the word, they were actually um, faithful in the music, because they weren't using their own music, they were using music from generations before us. Um, so one of the points Sean asked me to talk about was um, the connection between form and substance. Um, most Anglicans um, and Christian traditions generally recognize how important it is that the form and the substance relate, that the form affects the substance and the substance affects the form. Um, so in other words, the content of what we do reflects what we believe. Um, so the late Librarian of Congress Daniel Borston, I, I found a quote by him that I really liked that talks about how that relates to art. Um, he wrote, when Michelangelo in the traditional story explained that he carved his statue of David simply by taking away the superfluous marble, he meant that his peculiar vision dwelt somehow in that particular block of stone. Sculptors always, of course, choose a piece of marble because it is well suited to the figure that they have in mind, and they often shape the figure to the marble's flaws. Every artist marries form to matter. He sees his poem in words, his paintings in oil on canvas, his statue in stone, and his building in some specific matter. So there's a relationship between the message of the lyrics and the musical setting of those lyrics. So I'm going to give you a secular example. Um, do you guys know Bon Jovi's It's My Life? Okay, so this is my favorite motivational song ever. <laughs> um, in, in the music itself, right, you hear a lot of like defiance, stubbornness, anger, it's all there. That's Bon Jovi. Um, if you had him sing that to a bunch of flutes, it would be pretty much pathetic. Um, or if you had a string orchestra back it up, might be a little better, but you don't, you don't get it unless you've got the guitars and the bass and the drums backing them up. Um, so that's what music can do to lyrics. If you, if you separate the two, you can have really strange combinations um, that don't reflect each other. Um, so one of the great things about an organ is that it's the most comprehensive of all, of all instruments. It's the only one that can make all these different noises um, and sounds. So I'm not going to totally geek out on you right now, um, so, but I'm just going to give you a little flavor of that. There's, there's four main sounds that the organ makes. Um, there's the uniquely organ sound of the diapason, um, which is a full sound. I play most of the hymns on it. Um, there's a string sound that imitates the human voice. A, is, it's a lot more ephemeral. Um, there's a flute sound um, that would sound like flutes that you would hear um, that are just flutes. So that's more reflective. I play that a lot during the offertory or communion. And then there are reeds, the brass or orchestra sounds. They sound like oboes and French horns and trombones and trumpets. And they add the oomph. So on Easter, they're all pulled out. Um, so all those sounds I never use all at once. You never hear all the organ at once because it's not necessary, right? So um, during Lent, I might never pull out a reed or um, 
as I said during Easter, I'd pull them all out. Um, so for some of you, the organ isn't, the, you probably don't know the history of the organ. Probably none of you do. <laughs> um, so it's actually a really old instrument. It's, um, it's an ancient instrument. It's, it was invented in Greece in uh, about the thir- 3 BC. Um, and it was a secular instrument and only used in secular settings. Um, it was used for festivals and circuses. And the reason it was was because it makes a lot of noise, right? Um, usually when people complain about the organ, they complain it's too loud. That's why. Um, so it, it became part of the church about in about the 10th century and has been used since then. And the Benedictine monks were actually the ones that started incorporating it. Um, they were very interested in the uh, art and technology and science and how they interplay with each other. And um, when they were introduced to organs, those all those... Um, areas are encompassed in an organ. So if you think about it, we have an organ that is, yes, is involved in music, but also there's technology that's involved in creating it. Um, it's usually part of the architecture of the church. Um, it's involved in the liturgy. It's um, part of industrial organization, and it actually changes with time. The organ we play here does not sound like an organ you'd hear in Germany, probably, um, because they're older and they sound differently. Um, so that kind of gives you a background of um, ways that organ itself can can link the um, message and the vehicle that carries the message. Um, and then the last point that Sean had in the bulletin um, was about the significant difference in sound of human voices versus recordings. And I'm just going to touch on that for a second. Um, but if you listen to a recording, you're actually not hearing the full sound. Um, and if you listen to an analog recording, you're listening to more of more of the full sound than if you listen to a digital recording. So um, one of the great things about singing together or worshiping with um, real instruments that are, that are digitally um, being projected to you through speakers is that you're actually hearing a f- more full encompass of sound. Um, so it's kind of an interesting point. Um, but, but the most important thing that I would leave with you is that singing trumps everything in music. Um, I actually play the organ um, because I'm interested in congregational singing, not because I like the organ, so that's what I have to do. Um, And that's that's not true for a lot of organists, so um, I really enjoy congregational singing. Um, I am heartened by the singing of a group of people, and um, I'm not a particularly good singer. It's a, you never see me sing into a microphone, um, but that's not really the point, and that's not why God gave us our voices. So I would encourage each of you, even if you don't sound that great, sing hearty because um, the Lord created that in you. Um, he created what one musician um, friend of mine calls my instrument, the throat. <laughs> um, he, he created an instrument for you, and it sounds just fine regardless of whether you're mic'd. <laughs> so thank you. James, would you come forward, please? James is going to give us a bit of... Um, but my mic died. James is going to give us... A, there it goes. A bit of um, the details and the technicality on how the organ works. So thank you very much for inviting me to come today. I really truly enjoy coming to churches where there's lots of interest because when we talk about worship today, I thought about that word and I said, well, another important word with worship is stewardship. And that's what I see at this church. And it it really touches me, the fact that there is stewardship here and we care for this instrument. And when Leah was talking about art and sculpture, we are all very visual people. We want to see a beautiful stained glass window, woodwork, you know, and organ pipes. But in this organ, you don't have that opportunity to see the organ pipes. I did bring a sample, which I'll talk about quickly. But uh, we have to use that art. We have to get that in our, our, through singing, through appreciating sound, that we develop that beauty in our ears to see what the organ gets to offer. So, you know, organs are here to stay. Sometimes people say, oh, they're getting old. They're a thing of the past. We need to replace that. Organs, I've, uh, I'm continuously working on restoring organs. We're working on building instruments. So it's not a thing of the past. It's here to stay. 
Um, you look at Europe, we've, I've gone to Holland where my uh, family has come from, and in Holland you actually see organs that are, I've seen an organ that was 360 years old. It has gone through a series of uh, renovations. So it's uh, taking care of things. If you look at our physical plant, our buildings get old, our carpet gets old. This church has probably gone through a number of carpet changes, or the roof has been redone a few times, or a number of boilers have been done but how much work has been done to the organ. So it's, it's a part of the physical plant that the organ needs to be done. And just like our bodies, uh, like we talk in scripture about the body of Christ, how we worship, in our bodies, we also have to take care of ourselves. We age, we have to work on our teeth, our hearing, our eyesight, hip replacements, lots of things happen, and we have to maintain our own bodies to continue worshiping. So that's why I want you to think when we talk, think about the body of Christ, we think about our own bodies, but the physical plant and the pipe organ. So, so uh, keeping this organ in good shape is very important. And some of the things we have done uh, will be uh, shown on a PowerPoint or uh, in the bulletin, there's probably a, a site where you can look at home on your computer, uh, Flickr, and you can see photographs of some of the work we've done. Uh, we actually, with a team of three of us, this earlier this week, went into the organ chamber on the left, and it's like walking through a cave and lots of dust, so I'm, I'm absorbing the holy dust that's been here and all the singing. So we look at the organ as a spiritual be, uh, instrument. It's picking up the air and all the singing over years, and it's settling in the organ, and we're breathing it in. But it's holy dust, I always say. So uh, we pulled two bellows out. We've taken them to our shop. Uh, we've gone through a restoration of putting new leather on it, cleaning them all up. Uh, next week we'll go and put them back in. We did close the wind off on that side, allowing the organ, remainder of the organ to keep playing. And then once we get that hooked up again, um, the organ, that part of the organ will work again, and then we'll do tuning of the organ. And when we uh, talk about organ, uh, we also will tune the pipes. Back in the organ, you actually will see um, if you had the opportunity to see organ pipes, this is an example of an organ pipe, a diapason, and this is not that uh, large, if you like. Uh, it's a smaller pipe, but pipes can be as tall as that screen or a little bit above that. So we have pipes 16 foot length to even the, the size of this or smaller, so pipes can be in various ranges. Uh, we talk about the pipe as parts of the body when we define elements of that pipe. So when it's very organic. If we look at the bottom of the pipe, we actually see the bottom part, which we call the foot, or the toe right here. Then this part we call the foot of the pipe. And this long part is the body of the pipe. And in front you see, of course, the opening, which is the mouth of the organ with a lower lip, an upper lip, and this one actually has ears. Some pipes don't have it. And so we use parts of the body. When we talk about the body of Christ, they even name parts of the organ pipe uh, as body parts. And pipes are gonna be made of different metals. This is a zinc, or it could be made out of wood for flute sounds, or uh, pipes are a little bit, uh, still made out of metal, but they can give uh, trumpet sounds. So this organ has all those sounds, as Leah had talked about. Um, but uh, it's a smaller instrument. So uh, I always tell people, if you have a pipe organ, keep it up because once these organs leave the church, it's harder for uh, congregations to, to get them back. So preserve what you have, and I thank you for having the opportunity to be of service here and taking care of this instrument. Thanks, James. Um, as, as James mentioned, um, there's pictures out in the um, coffee room there being projected of the bellows um, and what, what's actually being redone over at the workshop right now. And so uh, he'll be available after the service as well as Leah and, you know, hopefully he'll be available too, right? And, and I'm always here, so you can always talk to me but they're much more interesting. Talk to them. Um, and thank you both for speaking. Hopefully this has been educational and uh, hopefully it, it's helped you understand some of the dynamics of worship 